is the police department, and we're joined by Chief Steve Anderson. Chief, uh, if you would please uh, introduce who you have brought with you and then make any comments you have on the mayor's proposed budget and any comments you want to make in general to the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen of the council. Uh, for the opportunity to be here to make this presentation. Uh, sitting with me, uh, our finance manager, Ms. Mr. Samir Mehik, and his assistant, Ms. Kathy Kirkham. In the back, uh, have a whole host of people, probably the most important people uh, in our department, and I say that uh, including me. Uh, the most important people are our commanders, uh, Michelle Donegan of the Hermitage Precinct, Marlene Pardue of the West Precinct, uh, Tony Carter of the North Precinct, Mike Alexander South, and Brian Johnson Madison, David Imhoff, East Precinct, and Lieutenant Jason Proctor is substituting for Jason Reinbold, the commander of the Central Precinct. We also have Captain Hunsecker at the Training Division, Captain Gordeen, the Youth Services, and Captain Gordeen, I think you know, is serving as your Sergeant at Arms uh, at this point. Uh, Dahana Jones, Special Operations, Mike Hager, Strategic Development, Paul Tricky, Specialized Investigations, Kay Loki, Domestic Violence, Ray DePriest is here with us. He is our, uh, he is our lab manager. Mr. Don Aaron and Ms. Ms. Chris Mumford, our PIOs. Ms. Sue Bibb, our HR specialist. Sue, you back there. And Ms. Donner Spencer also works in uh, physical. And maybe most important, we have Robert Weaver here with us. Sergeant Weaver is the re president of the Fraternal Order of the Police. And my sp special leadership team, the Deputy Chief, Deputy Chief Louise Kelton, Field Operations, Deputy Chief Todd Henry of M Administrative Services, and Deputy Chief Damien Huggins of Investigative Services. Ladies and gentlemen of the council, did I miss somebody? <laughs> well, well, stand up, Terrence, so we can see you. <laughs> Terrence is serving double duty right now. Terrence is in charge of the Criminal Investigation Division. And in addition to those duties, he has taken on, on a temporary basis, the commander of the Office of Professional Accountability. So uh, uh, he's a small guy, and sometimes I miss him. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to express our st extreme gratitude for, the, uh, for your support that you've shown us over the years. As I attend neighborhood me meetings throughout the precincts, I, I often find you there. I know you're concerned about your constituents, and our commanders tell me that any time they call on you for some community problem that they need help solving, that you're always there. I can tell you it's great to be a member of this police department. It's the best that it's been in my 37 years. And I can't take credit for that. Uh, the credit goes to the leadership team that I just uh, introduced. They run the police department. They do all the heavy lifting, and I mostly take credit for it. I can present to you tonight a very lean and efficient police department. Our leadership team and our men and women on the streets make sure of that. If you indulge me just for a minute, I'd like to compare us just for this moment to Memphis. Memphis has a population of 682,000. Nashville has a population of 620,000. So they got about 60,000 more people than us. Nashville has 1,373 sworn officers. Memphis has 2,513, 2,513 officers. So we have one, one police officer for every 461 of our residents. Memphis has one police officer for 200 and every 271 of their residents. If we had the same ratio as Memphis, we would have 914 more police officers. Unfortunately, that would cost $63 million. So I'm not here tonight to ask you for $63 million to hire 914 police officers. I am here to ask you to let us keep what we've got because they do an outstanding job out there and I think a very efficient job. Well, just ask yourself, where would you rather be, Nashville or Memphis? <laughs> S 
speaking of the neighborhood groups, we have 516 organized neighborhood groups that we work with on a regular basis. Last year we attended over 1,430 meetings. So just about every night of the week you can find one of our commanders, one of our deputy chiefs, or me, at one of those neighborhood meetings. We assist those citizens with their problems in their communities. At the same time, we sort of take the pulse of the community, and that allows us to respond to the community in the manner that they expect. In the past year, thanks to your, your support, we were able to open the new Madison Precinct. 6.30 January 1, when this new precinct came online, the land area of the North Precinct was reduced by one-third. So by, by North giving up 69 square miles to the Madison Precinct, not only is the Madison Rivergate area now served by their own precinct, Commander Carter has 69 less square miles to cover. That means that he can work more closely with the people in the North, in the North Nashville neighborhood. Last, last December, we opened up a new facility for the West Precinct at uh, 5500 Charlotte Avenue. Certainly, this is a significant asset to the police department and certainly to the community. I think you're going to see a lot of urban renewal out there just based on the fact that the police department, that modern building, is sitting where it is. It's an old Ford dealership and it's now a modern facility. The men and women of the West Precinct are most appreciative. You know, they were working in cramped quarters. Uh, detectives had to go outside to actually make phone calls on their cell phones so they could hear people, so they could talk to victims, so they could talk to witnesses. So it's an extreme improvement. We now have a community room. I encourage you to have your community <laughs> meetings there. Uh, all the community, uh, uh, the surrounding communities are making very good use of that and you're, you're welcome anytime, uh, any community group is welcome anytime. Police Department takes the commitment of financial responsibility very seriously. I believe the mayor has proposed a thoughtful and judicious budget for our police force. It'll allow us to build on our successes without taking step backwards or losing ground. More than half of the recommended budget increase for the police department is necessary to fund the operation of the Madison Precinct next year. We could not have opened the Madison Precinct without the 50 officers hired through the federal COPS grant. This paid their full salaries and benefits for three years. That grant expires this fall, as we knew it would. Without additional fundings, these, these 50 officers will lose their jobs and we would be in violation of our contract with the federal government in which Metro agreed to retain these officers for a minimum of 12 months after that three-year agreement. The mayor's recommended budget also provides for the hiring of 17 scientists to, hire, to, to staff our police department's first ever DNA crime laboratory. It's projected to open uh, mid-year mid, mid next year, mid-year 2013. We intend to bring those persons on board during the next few months, get them up to speed, and as the crime lab opens, uh, we'll be ready to start the accreditation process. The potential exists for us to work more than 1,000 DNA cases a year. About 300 of these would be related to sexual assaults, homicides, other personal violent crimes. Then more than two-thirds of that could be devoted to property crimes. That's a luxury we do not have. Uh, there's a screening process presently with the TBI. And let me, let, me, let me be clear, the TBI does very excellent work. Uh, they're very cooperative, but they're doing all they can. So there's a screening process where, where in the district attorney for each district has to write a letter requesting a test. Uh, and so basically that's uh, limited to personal crimes. We intend to drive this down to property crimes. Residential burglaries is, uh, is uh, an emphasis uh, where I place my emphasis every day, moving our flex teams about. And we feel like we can solve residential burglaries before the person does their 10th or 20th one. In addition to DNA, this will be a full service lab. We'll be doing firearms, toxicology, and fingerprint analysis. I've said this uh, to you before, I know, but uh, uh, five to ten years from now, a police department that doesn't control their own DNA analysis 
would be like a police department today that doesn't engage in fingerprint analysis. With that, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. McGuire, I entertain any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chief, very much. And uh, quickly before I start recognizing members, I forgot to mention that Mr. Cooper reminded me that the budget staff is um, in committee room. Are they just one of the committee rooms back here. If members have specific questions about the budget, trying to find a, a line item or whatever the case may be, the budget staff is available to help us uh, back there. So just wanted to make the committee aware of that. Councilman Tiger, you are recognized. Thank you and welcome, Chief. I promised I wouldn't say anything about Commander Pardue's uh, uh, eating habits, so I will not do that today. So it's a little running joke we have. Uh, question for you. Um, you may not have the statistic with you, but let's talk ab about take-home vehicles and the officers that live out of county and, and the policy on take-home vehicles. How many vehicles are taken home to their neighborhoods uh, within Davidson County now, approximately? Or if you don't have it specifically, you can get that to us. I, I would not. Uh, we have about 1,189 vehicles. Uh, of those uh, 633 are marked vehicles. Most of those vehicles will be take-home vehicles except for what we call the shared car. Of course, we have extra cars to use in the event a car breaks down and we, we have what we call uh, shared cars. We do not have enough cars to go around, so those cars stay at a precinct and they're used by, generally they're assigned to two officers. No car leaves the county. No car marked or unmarked leaves the county. So a lot of those shared cars are out of uh, officers that live out of the county uh, that share a car, want them to work the A shift, want them to work the B shift, and so forth. I do not have a number on how many th that are take home, but uh, a large majority of them are. Those people, all the patrol officers, everybody on 24-hour call would be in a take-home vehicle and would be in those neighborhoods. I think when we made the change to allow those take-home vehicles was a tremendous thing for neighborhoods. The, the presence in the community, uh, the, seeing those vehicles it gives a lot of folks a lot of comfort and I have no problem at all fully funding that. Um, the follow-up question had to do with the, the number of, of uh, non-shared cars that, of officers that lived out of the county. When, when they, if there are such officers, when they finish the day, do they go back to the, to the uh, precinct and check in, take care of paperwork, or if they end up, uh, would they just drive straight uh, toward home and then park that vehicle at the county line? Oh, oh uh, officers that live out of the county. Out of the county, place. officers, well, yes. Uh, uh, our rule is they have to be uh, parked at a metro facility. So if it's a shared car, it would certainly have to be at back at that individual precinct so they could be used by the next right. officer. But if it's not a shared car, um, my, my question is the value of, of parking those at metro facilities on the county line, if, the, if they were going back to the to the precinct to handle paperwork or to, to close out the shift, uh, the value of taking that car to the county line and parking it and then getting in their personal vehicle to go further as opposed to, to bringing their personal vehicle to the precinct. It has to be a police department facility. And the reason for that is just so there is some security for the vehicle. Sure. But of course, we have, um, we have the seven precincts, and then we have uh, Metro Southeast. Uh, we have the Domestic Violence Division. We, we probably have 10 different facilities. So, so none of the vehicles are parked at uh, um, fire halls or any other type of, of metro facility? That, that would be the rule. Metro, it would have to be a police department facility. That is our policy. Just a police department facility. Yes, okay, I was mistaken then. I, I, I see some of our vehicles, and it may be Sheriff's Department or others, that, that's, that are parked at, at fire halls and, and other locations near the county line there. And, so. I, and I could not argue that, I, I, but our policy is a, a police department facility. Right, thank you. Councilman Hunt, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, glad to see you, Chief. Um, I know that you and I have had a lot of conversations. I just want to uh, give you and comment on you as well as Commander Carter. Man, I talk to him all the time because uh, I'm one of the more fortunate ones that get to enjoy the use of two precincts. 
uh, east of I-24 and west of I-24. And <clears throat> when they shrunk the distance between what uh, Commander Carter had, it made it much better for us in terms of response time on both sides of 24. So I just wanted to comment to you and, and, and the men that you have on the street, because I see a lot of them, they're doing a great job, and I'm just so happy to uh, have the services of two precincts. Thank, Thank you for your service. Thank you. Commander Carter, if you'd stand up when the councilman's talking about you. Uh, Commander Carter has one of the hardest precincts in that he has a, a, a traditionally high crime area and also has a large geographical ma mass to cover. But uh, Commander Carter was, was, was raised in the North Precinct and he takes ownership of that. And he works very hard every day. Uh, each of our precinct commanders bring something uh, different to the plate and they all thankfully steal from ideas from each other. And thank you again, and I also want to recognize Commander Brian Johnson, the other half of uh, our police force in the 3rd District. Thank you. Brian is our new, newest commander, and he hit the ground running. Thank you, Councilman. Councilman Baker, you're recognized. Thank you, sir. Uh, Chief, it's good to see you here today. Uh, appreciate the fine work y'all are doing, and uh, you're right about the new West Precinct. That facility out there uh, is great. I've had some meetings in the community room out there, uh, and it, it's really a good place to have a meeting. And I'd also like to thank Commander Pardee for the work she's done, and uh, all the West police officers in the West Precinct. They're doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Agreed, Councilman Baker. Thank you. Councilman Pardue, you're recognized. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chief, the only question I've got is it deals with your school resource officers. Uh, I understand that you've got 66 people assigned to that and 216 school crossing guards. Does the school's budget help you in any way to pay these salaries or is, is it all coming out of your budget? It, it all comes out of the police department budget and, and uh, you know I've struggled with that concept for some time uh, just for the SROs in the schools it's about 5.9 million dollars a year. Uh, I, I take into account that uh, they need to be in those schools I think I think we all agree on that uh, uh, we it's it's imperative that we have them stationed in those schools and it's a matter of whether we do it or the schools do it so probably uh, we get a lot of law enforcement benefit about having our own people in there uh, they keep up with the kids they keep the officers on the street informed of who's not in school that might be a problem and so forth so uh, I guess in an ideal world the schools would take on that and provide the officers but on the other hand uh, if uh, if that were to occur, I doubt that Mr. Reveling would let me keep that $5.9 million. Well, Mr. Reveling needs to let that slide a little bit because <laughs> the, the school board the, <laughs> the school board don't mind asking for 46 million extra dollars and I think that they should at least share this cost with you. Thank you. I understand. Thank you, Councilman. Council Lady Barry, you're recognized. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Chief. I'm over here, sorry. Yeah. The voice right, is Chief. this, yeah, this oh. over here. Hey! <laughs> uh, thank you for coming down, and thanks for the, the, the excellent start at the beginning to compare and contrast what we could look like if we were not Nashville. And I wanted to just take a second and ask you, looking at the budget, if you were to get no money <coughs> this year, no new money. no new money, what does that do to you? Well, obviously that scenario would have to play itself out, and we don't know exactly what would happen. But uh, the first plus analysis, we would lose about 200 officers. Uh, one, we would lose 50 for sure because we would not have the money to continue their salary. And then the, the trickle-down effect of that, uh, depending on how much of the $7.5 million in the COPS grant we had to pay back, that could be up to 150 more officers. So uh, our, our first analysis is we would lose about 200 officers. And, and the impact of that, and I think you can just speak broadly, I don't need specifics, but it, it's my understanding that right now our crime rates, our murder rates are way down. 
Well, the murder rate is way down this year. Uh, our crime rate uh, is uh, is decreasing every year. We had one little spike in 2010 that we went a 1% in the red, so to speak. But uh, yes, uh, it put us in position. I sat uh, at, the, at the table with the major city chiefs association and listened to uh, the cities that have had to make major layoffs, some of them that you may not know about. You know, we all hear about New York and Camden and places like that, but San Jose, California, that's a city comparable to us in an affluent area. They just lost 130 officers. Sacramento, California, just lost over 100 officers. They have no, they have no drug enforcement teams. They have no, they have no special teams whatsoever. Matter of fact, the chief uh, in Sacramento, Rick Brazil, uh, has been tasked with the responsibility of giving lectures on how to downsize if you have to. But that would, that would be the reality for us. And uh, generally speaking, the uh, outside public says, well, lay off the non-sworn people. But our non-sworn people is what's keeping the sworn officers on the street. So uh, every time we lay off somebody in the computer room or somebody in payroll, then we have to bring a police officer in uh, at a higher salary most of the time to take that place. But uh, to answer your question, we'd be looking at about 200 officers. Okay, so uh, 200. And even with the new money, you are, you are losing a couple of full-time employees, correct? Yes, uh, I think that uh, uh, we were asked to, to, to decrease our regular operating budget by $250,000. So uh, I think there's uh, three full-time equivalents that we are losing to accomplish that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council Eddie. Councilman Pridemore, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Chief. A very rare opportunity for I to question the Chief, where through my career, I've normally been the one, the recipient of that. Uh, <clears throat> I hope you don't remember any of those times. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, first of all, as the recipient of the Madison Precinct in my district, I just want to say thank you. Uh, our constituents are are in love with the, with the precinct and the officers there. They have been uh, a great asset to our community. They've um, uh, assisted us in so many ways in all of our community meetings and also when we have uh, cleanup days, we had at least 15 officers and Commander Johnson being one of them and the shift commanders that were present and helping us pick up trash. So they, they serve in many capacities out there and we're very pleased to have them. Very good. The, um, Questions I have is concerning the DNA lab. Is there ever any other department in in Tennessee other than the TBI that has a DNA lab? Not, not to my knowledge, and uh, certainly none of the other major cities at this point. Uh, again, we would, uh, uh, as I say, you know, the, the, we can't let the future pass us by. Uh, we're at the point where that um, uh, uh, the expendables for a DNA test is around forty dollars. It's very cheap, very cheap. Obviously, you have the overhead, you have the salary, you have the, uh, you have the uh, uh, equipment and so forth. But uh, I'll, uh, I'll give you an example of where we are today. Uh, when you're not doing anything, uh, Google uh, poo prints. Poo prints. There is a company in Knoxville called BioPet Labs. And for $50, uh, they, well, they contract with apartment complexes throughout the nation. And uh, what they do, apparently dog owners maybe not be too good at, after cleaning up after their dogs. And, and uh, so the apartment complexes uh, counter this by gathering samples and sending it to poo prints. And for $50, they analyze that sample. So that's how widespread DNA testing is at this point. Uh, so certainly if apartment complexes uh, see the necessity to engage in that, it's, cer it's certainly something that we don't need to get left behind on. Interestingly, they've even coined a phrase for the, uh, for the vi those canine violators, and I'll, I'll let you find that uh, on the internet. The, the turnaround with the TBI, and I know they're highly, highly uh, overworked, uh, what is the, the turnaround on submitting a a violent crime case such as a rape or a homicide uh, to where where it will 
the results when it's submitted until the officer or the case investigator gets the results? Well, well obviously, it, and it would depend on the case, if there was a violent criminal on the loose and uh, it was imperative that person be caught as soon as possible before additional crimes could be committed, uh, those, those things can be done in two or three days. But the average time on our turnaround for DNA testing, as an example from the TBI, is 16 weeks. Again, I don't want to be critical of the TBI. They're churning them out as fast as they can. Uh, you know, we could turn them out in, in, in 48 to 72 hours. Uh, there's a process that's gone through in the DNA testing, but that puts that information in the hands of uh, the detectives as soon as possible. And uh, I should add that recently, uh, over the probably three years ago, the legislature amended a statute that was already on the books and expanded the mandatory DNA testing for arrestees. So there is a whole laundry list of, of uh, offenses that if you're arrested for, not only do we collect your fingerprints, we, we collect a DNA sample. And I need to compliment the sheriff here. That involves taking something uh, similar to a Q-tip and doing a cheek swap inside your mouth. And we thought that since we had just arrested somebody, they might not be in that good a mood with us and for us to try to accomplish that. So the sheriff department agreed to take that on. And so for every arrestee, that sample is collected and it's sent to the TBI, and then we have it available in a national database. So we get a lot of, uh, we get a lot of hits from that. We get what we call reverse hits. Uh, we may take a DNA sample from a murder 10 years ago that you might have been working, and then tomorrow somebody gets arrested in uh, Washington State. That sample goes in. You've had, you've had that analysis in for two or three years. All of a sudden we get some, what's called a reverse hit, where the, your test hits up with the one that just come in, that cheek swab, and you've got your suspect. Thank you, and that, that seems to become more and more of the cases that, um, recently with all the additional DNA samples that are being submitted. Every state has statutes similar where that there's a national database, mm -hmm. and just like fingerprints, uh, if it's in there, uh, it's gonna find us. So there's no question that when or if we have do uh, develop the DNA lab for the Metropolitan Police Department that we will be able to expedite these cases in a much quicker turnaround at, at I mean initially because of the uh, uh, other than 16 weeks exactly and, and, and again we have and, and director Gwen and I have a great relationship and from time to time I call him and tell him how important this test is but I don't wear out my welcome there because there's 95 other counties that, that we're in line with, but we would be in control of our own destiny, that uh, a detective could impress upon the com uh, Terrence Graves, the commander of CID, to say, this one is really important, this is a violent person we need off the street today. And that test, we, we would have people working overnight to make sure it's done. Okay, and one last question. Uh, is there any way possible that, that maybe in the near future, or has this even been considered, that we will be able to assist other, other departments with their DNA analysis. I'm talking about Goodlettsville, um, Hendersonville, other area departments that might, might be interested in utilizing our facility, and maybe, I hate to say this, but at a price. Well, you know? I, I won't mention his name, but the gentleman sitting over here to my far right has already mentioned that to me, that at some point we may take on contract work from other agencies and uh, recoup some of our cost and operating expense. But Mr. Reubling has already uh, had that idea, discussed it with me, and uh, he's, he's very efficient at that sort of thing. Making a good comeback now, Chief. <laughs> <laughs> Councilman Mitchell, you're recognized. Yes, and on the same lines of the DNA lab, wouldn't one of the other advantages be the chain of custody? Uh, you know, without having to send it off if it's being done in-house, you know, for, you know, conviction purposes, uh, not having to prove that chain of custody once you send it off to TBI or another agency, uh, it'd be better for our our uh, prosecutors here in the city? Well, that's exactly right. And, and uh, although we take great precautions, there is always that opportunity. And I think you only have to read the headlines in Indianapolis, Indiana to see what's going on there. The huge shakeup they have had over in their government uh, over one blood sample 
uh, losing its chain of custody. So it's very, very important, and, and that's a very good point. Councilman Claiborne, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Chief. I appreciate all that the uh, men in the dark suits uh, do for our county. Especially want to uh, commend the, uh, the folks at the Hermitage Precinct, which uh, serves my district, uh, Commander Donegan, and all of the guys out there and, and women in, that are in uniform engage with our community uh, very effectively when, uh, when there is a question, when there's a need, then uh, there's always a, a quick response. Um, when you took uh, Sergeant Watkins and from me as a community uh, liaison and promoted him, uh, I, I wasn't sure that I was going to get a good replacement, but Sergeant White has done a tremendous job, and he is uh, working very hard with community groups. Uh, I think there's probably been at least a, uh, close to a dozen new neighborhood groups that have started since he's uh, he's been working out of the uh, the precinct there. And uh, district uh, or the Hermitage precinct is very proud to provide a uh, personnel resource pool for your promoted leadership. So. Uh, <laughs> Very good. I, 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 I'm always concerned. I, I used to always be concerned about taking a person out of a key position and who's going to replace that person. But we have such a wealth of talent in the police department at this point that uh, most certainly I'm expendable. Certainly there's probably about five or ten people back there that could take my place and you would never miss me. And the same way at the sergeant and the lieutenant level. Uh, there, there are up-and-comers all over this police department that step in and uh, I know you miss Sergeant Watkins, but you're proud to have Sergeant White. I am. I'm very proud to have Sergeant White and Commander Donegan. And uh, I, I do have one question. I noticed that you're, uh, you have an increase in your special events uh, budget. And I wanted to ask, uh, uh, when we have visiting dignitaries come to, uh, to Nashville, uh, does the city bear the total expense of all of that uh, protection, or do we get any kind of... Uh, assistance from the federal level uh, you know when when we're protecting these folks or uh, making way for them and uh, kind of an aside to that the people that are involved in that are are those off-duty officers that are on special assignment are they on duty officers is there a mix how, how does all that play out and is that associated in any way with your uh, your increase in the special events it, it is to some degree, and no, we do not get any reimbursement from the federal government. And actually, I've had a frank discussion with the people in charge of that security. Uh, I, I thought that they were imposing on us in a manner that uh, the public should not bear. So I've made it clear that we're going to protect those dignitaries when they come to town. I think that's our obligation. But I've made it clear that they don't get to dictate how many and where and so forth. And for the most part, I leave that to our special events coordinator, Lieutenant Corman. He's uh, vastly experienced in knowing what we need, where we need to provide uh, the protection. And to answer your question about the about the source. It's a mixture. Uh, a good many of that is from our special event money uh, to staff it, to plan it, and so forth. Uh, and then we draw on duty in, uh, resources. We don't like to do that, but uh, we got to the point with our special, uh, special events funding that uh, we were starting to have to draw from the, from the precincts, uh, taking officers to uh, staff particular events. Uh, such as you're talking about. So that's the reason that we've asked for the increase in the special events money that primarily keeps the officers in the precincts and we take care of those special occasions by the use of off-duty officers. Council Lady Dowell, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, actually, Councilman Claiborne asked one of the questions I had about the special events, but I'll piggyback on that and ask about overtime. Um, when the officers cover like the Titans games or uh, any patrol that way downtown for any kind of event, are they um, paid any additional compensation or is that through the regular budget through the police department? I'm not sure I understand your question. But well, when they go and patrol for the Titans game, who the, pays for that? Well, us and the Titans. The Titans pays for all the officers inside the stadium. And that would be a mixture of, uh, of our police officers and other police officers from other jurisdictions. Outside the stadium, that's covered uh, through our special events funding. Okay. 
And I just will take this moment to brag on the South Precinct. Uh, I've been extremely pleased with uh, Commander Alexander. Uh, I've heard only good things from people out in our community, and we really appreciate working with him. He's really done a wonderful job uh, doing a lot of community outreach, uh, educating all of the citizens out in our district about how to be vigilant and watch out for things. And, uh, and we've really built a good relationship with that precinct that we feel comfortable calling. And so I uh, just wanted to say that and tell you thank you, uh, and I appreciate the service. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Lady. Councilman Bednay, you're recognized. Uh, Chief, um, I... I I think you guys are great. I mean, I, I, I'm i repeating what everybody else said. I mean, I love my commander here and everybody who works at uh, South Precinct. Uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, the uh, tra uh, Transportation Licensing Commission. Uh, I noticed that you guys uh, take over um, different tasks around the city, like uh, school guards and things like that. Is there any way that you guys to, could take over the enforcement of, uh, of that department? Uh, we had been asked to fund additional enforcement so uh, additional taxi drivers could do that work, and so I was wondering if that could be handled through your police department. Well, well I think it could. Uh, I think we have the resources, you know, taking into account the uh, we would have to we would have to analyze it to see how many people we need, how many positions, and so forth. And we have a management team that could, that could oversee that. But uh, I think I would have to uh, have an analysis from the Department of Law because basically uh, those are, are our ordinances. It's uh, it's uh, we would be mixing criminal enforcement with civil enforcement. So I would uh, uh, we would have to make sure that we kept a clear separation. But. Uh, uh, yes, uh, it's not something I would be asking for, but uh, yes, uh, you know, frankly, men and women back there can manage most anything thrown at their way. Can you can you run the numbers for me and see if that will bring any savings to the city for for you to take over the enforcement from that commission? I, I think that the positions would have to remain the same. I wouldn't see any difference in the funding. Okay. I, I wouldn't think it would be cheaper for us to take it on or for any other department to take it on. Uh, the positions would need to be there and uh, the overhead as far as office space and vehicles and so forth. That, it that would pretty much remain the same. Thank you, Chief. Councilman Dominey, you're recognized. Thank you, Chairman. Um, <coughs> thank you, Chief, for being here, and I appreciate the service all of our officers do. Um, I can tell you I don't think there's anybody here on this council that wants to cut our police staff. Uh, I don't think that's going to be a problem. The one thing I did want to ask, somebody has sent us an email, one of the many we've received from uh, those opposing a tax increase, is that if we stopped our officers from stopping cars all the time and let them police, do other police work, that we'd all of a sudden have plenty of money. Can you explain the benefit that we get briefly from our uh, additional traffic stops and what that's difference that's made in our crime prevention efforts over the last year or so? Certainly, and, and, and simply stated, we can either just sit on the side of the road and watch the cars go by or we can interact. Uh, with those vehicles. It's the same way if you're, if you're on a walking beach, you can just watch everybody walk by you or you can interact with the public to see what's going on. And so that's our way of interacting uh, with the public. Last year we made uh, about 380,000 vehicle stops. We write a ticket actually 22% of the time. So uh, 22, uh, so about one out of every five times someone writes a ticket for the violation, gets a ticket for the violation they got stopped for. But uh, on the other hand, we're taking people out of the cars that's got outstanding warrants for other things. We're taking drugs out of cars. We're taking uh, uh, guns, firearms. We took about 2,200 guns uh, off the streets last year. So uh, not doing that uh, and just riding around looking around uh, w would, not, would not serve us well at all. Plus, we're out there, we're visible. For every car we stopped, there's probably 25 or 30 cars that's binding what they're doing because they do see us. And, and, and you know, to follow up, it, it, it's a very important process. It's, it's something that I watch very closely. It's one, one thing, uh, 
uh, that's uh, several thousand increase over last year, and, and that's self-initiated activity, and that tells you our officers are out there working every day, uh, and they're enthused about their work. Uh, I go to roll call, and uh, I find the officers are sort of bored with me. Some of them even look at their watch, uh, because uh, and I figured out after a while, they're thinking, you know, we could be out there at work instead of listening to you. So uh, it's not about writing tickets, but it is about seeing who's in those cars, who's going to those neighborhoods, and when we have a rash of residential burglaries, that's where we flood those, that, that neighborhood with those flex teams to make all those stops, see who's coming, who's going. Councilman Tiger, do you recognize? Thank you, Chief, and I promised uh, Mr. Cobb from Codes that I would also bring this up to the agencies that had jurisdiction uh, over we know what the primary function of the police department and, and the safety of our citizens, but one of the other benefits of having so many eyes on the street is we have a problem with visual clutter and litter and, and illegal signage and whatnot. And just while you're here and all your commanders are here, if you see any of these folks that are stapling the signs up illegally on telephone poles or erecting them in right-of-ways, it takes so many resources of the, of the codes department and public works and other departments. We need to get these folks fearful of, of committing this uh, act. So I would just ask you, uh, as a byproduct of, of the good work that you do in our community, if you would also help us police that. I know it's a low priority, but you know, with as many men and women as you have on the street, catching these folks up on ladders that are stapling stuff and, and hanging it would be a great help to our city. Captain Hager from our Strategic Development Division is sitting back there, so I'll ask him to put out a training bulletin calling the attention to all the applicable ordinances and uh, maybe that will get uh, the attention of the public. Council Lady Johnson, you're recognized. Thank you, Chair McGuire. Uh, again, uh, Chief, you know I just have the highest praise for you um, and your leadership. Um, have nothing but positive uh, regarding Commander Donegan as well as Commander Alexander. I have the um, uh, kind of unique uh, pleasure of being able to work with both the South and the Hermitage Precinct. And um, as you know, in our area, there is an increase, um, well, there is a need to increase patrols um, in our area. And so it comes to the question that I talked to you about some time ago um, in regards to cameras. I'm in no way saying that I'm promoting more cameras to be eyes all around the city. But I'm still trying to learn how many do we have at major intersections because uh, many of my constituents have expressed that, for instance, at Nashboro Boulevard um, and Bell Road, um, at Anderson and uh, Murfreesboro Road um, and at uh, Forest View and Murfreesboro Road. These are like strategic intersections where people would like to see cameras above the um, traffic lights so that when vehicles are leaving, when someone says, well, I saw a certain vehicle leaving um, uh, the vicinity, and, and trying to get information on something that particularly happened within that area, we feel that that would help to be able to have something in a major area where, people, where, where a criminal is leaving out of the community. Um, these are the main areas into the community, so they're gonna have to come in and out of these areas. Um, is that something that your department has been focused on or is that too costly because I don't know if the cameras that you have are those um, being monitored by the emergency communications uh, folks or how does that work and is that a possibility for us to be able to make those types of requests? But, and, and the answer to your question is, is all of the above. 
Uh, first of all, we have no what's called the so-called red light cameras, cameras that photograph uh, cars running red lights and, and, and mail citation and so forth. We have none of those. We do about town and mostly in the downtown area have uh, several cameras that do monitor uh, the, the activity in the area. There's some up in the Madison area uh, that was funded by the, uh, the council people in that particular uh, district uh, probably five years ago. Okay. Uh, but Deputy Chief Huggins and uh, Commander Reinbold uh, are, are working on a, on a network system. They're working with Metro IT. Uh, they are very valuable cameras, uh, very valuable to law enforcement. Uh, crimes are often solved by going back. Uh, for the most part, uh, we have to pull the hard drive or the, the server out of that camera. But at some point, we can have some of them uh, on a network, and as time goes on and as resources allow, it is it is very resource intensive in that one, the cameras do cost money. Two, you have to have the uh, the infrastructure in place to monitor and uh, to service and retrieve and the storage facility and so forth. So, but it is something that we are working toward. There, there is no money in this budget uh, to expand that uh, to any great degree. But as time goes along, we do consider that a very valuable law enforcement tool. Uh, Deputy Chief Huggins can tell you about some homicides that were solved downtown through the use of those cameras. So are some of those funded in partnership with say TDOT? Or were the, the cameras that you're mentioning that are downtown and in Madison that the council members got together for s just certain strategic areas, were they fully funded out of the metro budget? The, the latter. Uh, we don't have any shared cameras with TDOT. TDOT does have various cameras around and uh, on the major interstates. But, uh, and, we, and obviously we would have access to those to monitor cars. And, and sometimes we use those if we want to know we had a... We had a situation on Ellington Parkway uh, recently, uh, over the last couple of years, where that, that uh, you know we we searched the database that they had, but uh, we didn't find what we wanted. But uh, we don't have any shared cameras with TDOT, no. So, like a state road, like Murfreesboro Road and Bell Road, if we had wanted to put some on the top of the traffic lights there, that would have to be something that would have to be explored. I, yeah, I think most of ours are our own poles and not on the on the lights themselves. Okay, thank you. Council Lady Blaylock, you're recognized. Council Lady Blaylock. Oh. Thank you. You said that um, only 22% of the time that you guys take it, which I'm sure most people would be very happy about that. But in a, can you speak to the reason why we don't take it and whether or not that is or is not a revenue generation? Well, certainly it generates revenue, and, and uh, uh, I think 22%, that was the figure for 2011. Uh, year to date this year, it's down to about 16%. Uh, I leave it to the officers. It's, it's within the discretion of the officers. Uh, we want people's attention for the violation. Maybe the violation was something minor, like a headlight. Uh, maybe it was something they didn't use their turn signals. So that's completely within the discretion of the officer. And I certainly don't want to get in a situation where we're using traffic citations to uh, generate revenue. They do generate revenue, but that's not the driving force. The driving force is talking to those people in the vehicles, talking to the passengers in the vehicles, smelling the marijuana that's being smoked in there. Uh, that sort of thing, and arresting the people that need to be arrested and giving those people a warning uh, that need a warning. But again, that's uh, within the discretion of the officers, and I would not want to take that discretion away. Go ahead. For the last five or ten years that it's been, you know, under 30 percent ticketing. I would have to go back to look, but uh, uh, probably over the last three to four, yes. Thank you. Council Lady Johnson, you are recognized. Thank you, Chair McGuire. I'm sorry, Chief. Um, I failed to follow up and ask, when you mentioned the five council members that were able to get those cameras in the Madison area and the ones that were downtown, approximately how much did each of those cost? I, I would have to get that figure to you. Okay. I do not know. Thank you. Chief Anderson, on behalf of the Budget and Finance Committee, I'd like to thank um, you and all of your officers for what you do every day to make our city safe. We really, really appreciate it. Council Lady Gilmore, did you have a question? 
Go ahead. Sorry, I did, though. I did. I thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate it. I don't know what happened. I just wanted to ask Chief Anderson about the crossing guards and just um, how their salaries work. I know recently they used to have money that came through from the state in the summertime, and that has been cut out. And as a result of that, they're really hurting. So I just wanted to uh, understand how the crossing guard salaries work, and will they be a part of those raises that come up this year, if you could speak to that. Uh, yes, and, and I can't give you the exact hourly figure that they're paid, but they are they are part-time employees, and they're paid for the, the, uh, the nine months or so that school is in session for their work. Now, at one point in time, as I understand it, uh, they were able to collect unemployment right. from the state during the summer months. As I understand it, that's that's no longer the case. Right. But to, to specific answer to your question, yes, uh, this budget proposes a 4% raise for employees at that level, and they would get that 4% raise. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. And again, Chief, thank you so much for uh, your participation here today.